Yeah. So, in, in a wonderful, courageous attempt to bring this diversion, diversity or uh, divestiture back into the fold of physics, um, we just have July 8, 2004, uh, Nature magazine reporting on Dr. Beck from London University. And this is the only source right now of this article. Um, but this reference actually is, is repeated, in, and it will be in my future energy e-news as well. If you're interested in getting on the email list, uh, just let us know. And what this gentleman has done, the scientist has pointed out, is as you recall the previous equation I showed you from Planck's second law, the uh, interesting thing is that without the, um, the zero-point energy term, you basically would have the dotted line approach. But with the uh, zero-point field, you'd have all of these um, paths for the uh, spectral density. And the interesting thing is the spectral density in Josephson junctions, which is basically a noise-driven uh, system, which allows for tunneling in superconductors, turns out to follow the graph that in, uh, includes zero-point energy. And what he found very fascinating, besides this particular graph, notice the frequency goes up to around 10 to the 12th, uh, is that they also map over to the dark energy spectrum. Now, he would like to propose that the cutoff for zero point and dark energy are the same, but there's a lot of controversy for that, and I won't even get into that um, uh, issue, because the cutoff for zero point may be much further for many reasons. But the fascinating part is we can now look at Joseph's injunctions or diodes as being a source of zero-point energy. And he's, of course, saying dark energy equals zero-point energy. So what do you do with the number of uh, different fluctuating systems if you know that the thermal energy um, really is no use or the non-thermal energy is really no use if it goes in both directions? Well, electrical engineers like us basically want to use a diode and force it to go in one direction only. And so a thermoelectric noise, it's called, um, you find quantum noise, uh, non-thermal noise, but basically in any circuit, when you get to the lowest level possible, you get a mixture of both, especially if you're at any temperature above absolute zero. And these three patents I would recommend is perhaps the most significant discoveries that have been patented in this field. For example, metal-to-metal -metal diodes, if you study this brown patent, uh, 3890161, oh, that'll give you a really good estimation of the engineering approach to um, applying sheets of metal-to-metal -metal diodes, which uh, basically have very low uh, forward drop and, um, and the potential for the application. The Eater patent I'm not that excited about because he has to use a battery to get the thing working. So even though I analyze it in my uh, feasibility study, uh, I'm not recommending it. However, the Capasso patent, which is an AT&T patent, uh, 4704622, is a very uh, solid zero-point energy um, tunneling diode uh, patent. And what's fascinating about Capasso is he actually acknowledges zero-point tunneling is the only source of activity for that diode. This, to me, was the best um, patent you could ask for to verify the fact that ZPE is real. Here's a physical device that doesn't work if zero-point energy doesn't uh, exist. And, um, and so even though Yader's, as you can see here, this is a Yader uh, diagram with uh, the voltages being applied, um, th there's the best example is perhaps a diode sitting by itself, unenergized except by the zero-point field. And so just uh, recently now, um, in 2004, uh, Yasu Tomi in Science Magazine has pointed out there's a number of molecular uh, diodes that are also um, uh, available. Now these particular ones that we see here are uh, peptide molecular photodiodes, about one nanometer. And of course this would be the ideal to work with a single molecule. But in this particular instance they also require organic um, end pieces that are receptors for photo input. So these would not be recommended, but it does give you the uh, appreciation for the fact that molecular diodes are now becoming um, available. And, and I feel very excited about that. Uh, let me go a few more minutes beyond this just so I can then get into the Q&A if I could. How much do you need to wrap it About five, five, ten, yeah. Go for it. <clears throat>
Oops. Oh, here we go again. I'm trying to back up. Yeah. Hey. Okay. So to uh, conclude here, we basically are looking at. Um, Push that button again. So yeah. Thank you. Now it goes back to up and down. We basically are looking at a number of. Whoops. I'm at. <laughs> we'll get it straight here. Okay. The summary to summarize the findings and the uh, technologies that are reviewed. At the top, we are looking at, from the Mead patent, for example, I examined microspheres, nanospheres, picospheres, and femtos. And it's fascinating to find physical representations of each of those in nature. Uh, for example, on the, um, I, I believe it was the nanosphere range, you basically find there's a leukocyte that, or, or I think it's a micro, yeah, it's on a micron scale. Uh, leukocyte that basically is fighting casimir forces to maintain its spherical size. And we find many examples of that now that biophysics and quantum physics are being uh, uh, really related. And you can use the um, zero, uh, E equals mc squared to get an appreciation of the energy that's available in a mass that size. And when you do the calculations, I just had a discussion about this earlier today, that the, the energy density tends to increase as the size gets smaller. This is a very controversial statement, uh, and we can only state that, that the physics and the equations predict that, but I can't really defend it because it, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense. You know, why, why would we have um, a milli EVs uh, in this realm, and then we get um, mega EVs in the femto region? But that's what Meade points out, that as his uh, collectors got smaller, he basically had a more powerful system. And zero-point energy constantly predicts that. So we'll, we'll leave that as many parts of zero-point uh, theory has been done. We leave it on the shelf until somebody proves it to us. <laughs> so after you look at the um, technologies, what I did is put them in table form and apply the um, feasibility to each one. <clears throat> the feasibility of the... Uh, electromagnetic spheres where you focus. I didn't even tell you about focusing. You can actually focus zero-point energy to a particular area. Just like a parabolic dish does, you can do the same with ZPE, which is also a, gets you thinking, a lot of ideas of increasing effects. These are moderately feasible. I would even see poor. I apply a feasibility, a poor feasibility to these just because of a number of um, extenuating circumstances that are involved. The mechanical approaches, which we talked about a few of them, for example, Pinto's approach and, and several others that involve mechanical systems that move and try to use the Casimir force. There are several, in fact, more than a half a dozen mechanisms where you can get Casimir forces to repel or Casimir forces to attract by changing the magnetic field, the temperature, the permeability, um, and the impedance, as we pointed out, and the uh, dielectric constant uh, by illumination. So all of those try to apply it, including spatial squeezing and so forth. But together, all of those are moderate feasibility. The highest rating, or high, I would say high rating, would be applied to the fluid dynamic approach um, in, for many reasons, but there are three different ones that apply fluid dynamics. And this to me is very exciting because all of a sudden we see an approach of motion. And receiving motion from the zero-point field is certainly everyone's dream uh, to get to the stars, of course.